We're now going to switch gears and look at some more fundamental properties of the solution to the rigid rotator. With these types of systems, it's typical that we describe them using their angular momentum instead of energy. We've already seen that the kinetic energy of the rigid rotator can be written as the angular momentum squared over two times the moment of inertia. This means that the Hamiltonian and the total angular momentum squared differ by a factor of two times i. As a result, L hat squared times the wave function from the rigid rotator is equal to h bar squared L, L plus one times y being the wave function from the rigid rotator. These same solutions to the Hamiltonian are also eigenfunctions of the square of the angular momentum operator, which can only have values given by h bar squared L, L plus one, where L is equal to zero, one, two, and any other positive integer. And these values of L are defined by the solution to the Schrodinger equation that we had used to solve for the rigid rotator problem. The quantum mechanical angular momentum operators can be found by taking the cross product between R and the Laplacian and multiplying it by I times H bar. They can be expressed in Cartesian or spherical coordinates. We will look at the spherical coordinate versions because our solutions to the rigid rotator are expressed in spherical coordinates. Out of the three components, LZ is by far the simplest, so we will focus on that one. Let's now find out if our solution to the rigid rotator is an eigenfunction of the Z component of the angular momentum. First, let's apply it to the phi component of the solution. This means that we would operate on capital phi with LZ, and that means that we take the derivative with respect to phi of capital phi, which means that the e to the im phi is what we're taking the derivative of, and that the negative ih bar, that can just go out front. What that's equal to is mh bar e to the im phi. Since we have a number times the original function returned, then we would say that phi is an eigenfunction of the LZ operator. Since it acts only on the phi coordinate, then we can apply it to the complete solution for the rigid rotator y. The theta components are not affected by the operator, so all those pieces move out to the front, and therefore it only acts on to the e to the raised to the power of i m phi part. The result is that the solution of the rigid rotator y is returned times h bar times m. Therefore, the solution to the rigid rotator is an eigenfunction of the LZ operator. We have shown that the solution to the rigid rotator y is an eigenfunction to both the total angular momentum squared and the z component of the angular momentum. So, by applying these operators to the wave function solution of the rigid rotator, the result will be the total angular momentum and the z component, respectively. This means we can straightforwardly determine the value of these classical observables. We can also show that these two operators commute by testing if the order of application matters. This means that it is possible to know both values simultaneously. I think this next bit is probably one of the neatest realizations that we come to in this whole course. First I'm going to summarize what we've just talked about. We have these two numbers, L and M, where L is 0 or any positive integer. We have m, which is equal to 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and on and on. And both these numbers are defined based on the solutions to the Schrodinger equation. We've just talked about how the total angular momentum squared commutes with the z component of the angular momentum. And we've also just talked about how if I apply the L squared operator to my rigid rotator wave function, then the eigenvalue that's returned to me is h bar squared times l, l plus 1. And if I apply the z component of the angular momentum to my rigid rotator solution, then I'm going to get m h bar returned to me. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how we can set basically a limit to the number m based on the value of l. And how I'm going to do that is we're going to say l hat squared is equal to lx squared plus ly squared plus lz squared. And I'm going to move my lz squared to the other side, so I'm going to have l hat squared minus lz squared. And that's going to be equal to lx squared plus ly squared. 
And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to multiply to the right hand side to both of these sides my solutions to the rigid rotator. L hat squared minus L z squared solution to the rigid rotator y L x squared plus L y squared solution to my rigid rotator. I'm going to distribute this inside the parentheses L hat squared times y minus L z squared times y and that's equal to L x squared times y plus L y squared times y. And so the application of these operators to my solution to my rigid rotator, well, my L hat squared applied to my y, that gives me h bar squared L, L plus 1 times y. From that I'm going to subtract off while applying my L z squared to my y. Well, if I apply L z once to y, I get m h bar. And if I apply it again, I get another m h bar. So I would get m squared h bar squared times y. And what that's equal to over here, well, if I apply my LX operator squared, then I'm applying my LX operator twice. And so presumably I would get returned LX twice, like the value of the angular momentum in the X direction squared. And again, I get my Y return back to me. And the same thing happens for the Y. I would get the value of the angular momentum in the Y direction squared. And I'm just writing in a generalized sense now. We don't actually know what these values are, and nor do we need to know them for the point of this exercise. Because what my next step to do is I'm basically now going to divide out my wave function y. Because in the end, it's really it's the eigenvalues that I care about. Because again, like I said before, I'm trying to relate m with l. So I can write my left-hand side as h-bar squared, because I have an h-bar squared in both terms. So I can distribute it out. What I get is l, l plus 1 minus m squared. And that's equal to LX squared plus LY squared. This next step requires a little bit of logic to understand what's happening. And basically, what we have on this right-hand side is that we have a value for the angular momentum in the X direction squared and a value for the angular momentum in the Y direction squared. And any number that's squared, well, that's going to be a positive number. So on this right-hand side, I have a positive number plus a positive number. And so what that means is that lx squared plus ly squared has to be greater than or equal to 0, which means that h bar squared times l l plus 1 minus m squared must also be greater than or equal to 0 because it's equal to lx squared plus ly squared. So I can write h bar squared l l plus 1 minus m squared. Well, that has to be greater than or equal to 0. What I can do now is I can divide through by h bar squared which basically cancels out that term. And so I can write L, L plus 1 is equal to M squared, and rather not equal to, but is greater than or equal to M squared. Now I want you to recall again that L is an integer and M is an integer. And so this relationship that we've just written down, what it implies is that the absolute value of M has to be less than or equal to L. And again, this is because L and M are integers. This, this L, L plus 1, is greater than or equal to M squared. Well, that can be simplified down to L being greater than or equal to the absolute value of M. So what that means, if I actually explicitly write that out, it limits the values for what M can be equal to. And so in this case, m can only be equal then, instead of being any positive or negative integer in 0, since now we have l that's now also defined in this um, problem for the rigid rotator, then m can only be equal to 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and on and on and on, up until plus or minus l. So in this case, if l is equal to 1, then that means that m can only be equal to 0, and plus or minus 1. The limits on L and M should look familiar to the L and M quantum numbers of the hydrogen atom. We'll be using these solutions to the rigid rotator for the solution of the hydrogen atom, so these limits will exactly apply there as well. What we have shown is that solely based on the limits imposed by the solution to the Schrodinger equation, 
as well as fundamental properties of measurement as quantified by commutation of the angular momentum operators, we can show the general shape of the periodic table. As we go down the rows, we will increase the n quantum number, which is something we will talk about in the next lecture. The L and M quantum numbers defines which column we are in. The L defines the shell, being S, P, D, F, and so forth. And M, which is limited by L, defines the total number of elements which can exist in each block, being 2, 6, 10, 14, etc., since two electrons can live in each orbital. I think this is one of the coolest results in the whole course that we can explain some of the major features of the periodic table simply from the limits imposed by the solution to the Schrodinger equation as well as the angular momentum of the system. Returning to the rigid rotator system, let's examine the degeneracy of energy. For each value of L, there are 2L plus 1 values of M. So for instance, if L is equal to 1, then there are three possible values for M, being negative 1, 0, and positive 1. Since m does not appear in the energy relationship for the rigid rotator, that means that there are multiple states defined by different m values that have the same energy. The term for this property is called degeneracy, meaning that multiple states have the same energy. So, looking again specifically at the L is equal to 1 state, the total angular momentum can be found by applying the total angular momentum squared operator to y m 1 which gives the value for the total angular momentum to be the square root of 2 times h bar. Finding the z component to the angular momentum means that we would apply the z component of the angular momentum to the wave function ym1, again, where we would get h bar m returned as the eigenvalue. This means that since m is equal to negative 1, 0, and 1, that the values of the z component of the angular momentum are negative h bar, 0, and h bar. As stated before, these three states are all degenerate, meaning that they have the same energy. Let's try to imagine what this actually looks like. Since it can be shown that none of the three components of the angular momentum commute with each other, this means that once we measure one of the components, like we just did with the z component, we cannot know the other two components at all. That means that we can draw the picture on the right, which is a set of concentric cones where the total angular momentum is the same, but the z component varies depending upon the value of m. We end up with cones because we cannot define the value of the angular momentum in the x and y direction. So that is represented as a circle because the angular momentum can be anything in the x and y direction. However, it ends up being a circle because it's defined to live at a specific z value, which is what we measured, and the radius of the circle is defined by the total angular momentum. In summary, we calculated the solution to the Schrodinger equation for a rotating diatomic molecule, and using the energy levels defined by the solution, we discussed the spectroscopy that we would expect to see from it. We saw that the energy levels were quantized due to the limits imposed by the solution to the Schrodinger equation, and by using the commutation of the total angular momentum and the z component of the angular momentum, we saw that the absolute value of m must be less than or equal to l. The rigid rotator result will also be used in the solution to the hydrogen atom, so the limits on L and M help define the structure of the periodic table.